Welcome everyone to our Innovation in the Classroom breakout session today. Uh, we're excited to share with you, as the title mentions, uh, innovation stories not from within the pool, even though it's asynchronous swimming day, nor the campfire, but rather the digital classroom. I am Ali Nakonik. I am a Slack customer success manager who works in the higher education space. So you can think of me as your trail guide for launching Slack and for seeking value out of uh, use cases where you can bring your digital campus to life within Slack. And I have been working with Arizona State for the past year and a half, which is inclusive of these two fine folks who have joined me today. So Prescott, I'll turn it to you. All right. So I am going to uh, request remote control of the screen real quick. Oh, just for the intro, sorry. Oh, my bad. <laughs> so yes, hello. <laughs> I am Prescott Perez Fox. I'm a lecturer in graphic information technology, uh, which is essentially a design program at the engineering school at ASU. Oh yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm Alexandra Milhaze and I also teach at ASU. I am a lecturer and I teach software engineering. Great, thank you. So before we hear from these fine folks, let's first orient ourselves uh, for our session here. While we'll have some time at the end for some Q&A, feel free to drop your questions as we go into the Zoom chat. We have experienced campers on the line, both Spencer and Andrea will be in there to moderate some of the questions you might have. They'll also be dropping some nuggets in channel as we go uh, in terms of references for topics that we discussed today and links to where you can find out more for what Professor Alex and Prescott are bringing to life. And speaking of orientation, let us also orient ourselves to the campground that is Slack. Just like a campground might have, uh, you know, different sites that you can stay at with different activities that are offered, Slack itself has different plans that cater to perhaps the different feature set that you might have access to or the scale of the group that you're bringing on board and then the cost relative to your use. So we have free and standard and plus plans that provide you a single workspace access for your team. And then you have enterprise grid. And that is the Slack plan that lets you centrally manage multiple plans in one. And that's what Arizona State uses to bring their digital campus to life. And if you want to find out more of those plans, check out the chat for your first link. And today, uh, for what happens in the digital campus, we want to make sure for those of you who might be new to Camp Slack, have a bit of a quick tour as some of these terms and visuals will come to life through what Prescott and Alex are doing in their courses today. With any digital campus, and then in this case with Arizona State specifically, you have a collection of workspaces that are all managed under that enterprise grid, ASU's digital campus. A single workspace when you click into it opens up the place where you and your team will actually collaborate. So in this case, uh, a single course translates to a single workspace where you've got a collection of channels that contain context-based conversations. This could be office hours or assignment-specific conversations, uh, or as we heard in this morning from Professor Matt Sofa, a hallway conversation for more casual chat. It also has your direct messages that span the entire digital campus. So you can DM your professor or DM your uh, co-major or your student government lead if you have questions or less formal conversations that you wanna have. Keep in mind up at the top here, Slack is a persistent way to communicate. So the conversations that you have collect and display over time. So if you forgot what assignment was posted or a question that your professor asked two weeks ago, you can search through the content in Slack or scroll back within a given channel or DM to recover that answer. The other nice part is in line with the conversation you might be having with your peers or your team, you also get to interact with apps that you use on the day to day. So obviously we're all in Zoom today, that's a popular one. This could be a document management tool, it could be everyone's favorite Giphy, or as you'll hear from Professor Alex, it could be a custom bot that you've built to also interact with your team. 
And most importantly, because we all have a voice, that bottom text box is where you contribute to the conversation and can share messages within that channel. Now that you've seen a bit of a refresher, or if you're brand new, how Slack works, I'll hand it over to you, Prescott, to take us through how you're bringing your course to life within ASU's digital campus. And I'm gonna stop my own control and you've got it. Oops, actually I am gonna stop screen sharing because my Zoom does not allow you to take control. Oh no, okay. Nope. Over to you. Okay, so uh, thank you Allie for that um, intro, that overview and I will <laughs> you caught me a little off guard. Let me just find the first page here. Yeah. Okay, now I'm ready. <laughs> um, believe it or not, I do this every day. So <laughs> <laughs> you're seeing the sort of, um, I don't know, sausage getting made. That's a gruesome phrase, but uh, we're all people here. But yeah, here's what I want to talk about today. And I mean this. These are three communication wins that you can use today. These are all very accessible. These are ways that if you're teaching in the classroom or even as a student or a teaching assistant, you can implement these upgrades, these wins, and make your experience a little more pleasant. So of course I am using Slack in my classes and I have been since I started at ASU, but I wanna back up just a little bit um, to set the stage here about sort of why we created the need for Slack. Um, and it's pretty simple in higher ed. <laughs> it's the numbers. And everyone that works in higher ed now has to be confronted with uh, larger class sizes, more communication, more hours, more research, everything is just kind of amped up. So in my case in particular, here's the numbers, right? Four classes per semester, which has become typical for a lot of teaching faculty. Um, large sizes, about 45 per class, and that includes online. Overall, there's 3,200 faculty, students, and alumni in our major in graphic information technology. And we have uh, communication needs within. And then of course, throughout the university, there's almost 18,000 faculty and staff who, who have other communication needs, right? I don't have particular needs to communicate with all 112,000 or whatever ASU is now, um, but I'm sure that's part of it as well. So that's how Slack sort of uh, you know, came to be. And really when you talk about numbers, you're almost always talking about uh, email. <laughs> and this is uh, often how it feels to just to be bombarded with so many email from every direction, from every topic. This is the default communication system for a large organization. Uh, not the greatest system, but it's kind of the default. And the way I uh, metaphorize it or explain it is almost like this, right? Where you have uh, email. I think I already clicked it once. I don't want to tempt fate. Let's try it again. Nope, I missed, there it is. Email is kind of like the empire, right? It's oppressive, it's ubiquitous, it's the, just, they just keep coming, endless numbers. And Slack is a little more the rebellion upstart, right? It's a more personal and more charismatic way of communicating, uh, ultimately to the same end. You could argue that the Alliance is its own sort of empire. Anyway, the other problem, and once you get into using Slack, you have this thing which I call workspace fatigue, I, something's going on with the click, where essentially we, um, you get involved in a lot of workspaces fast. And on the enterprise grid, um, you could have new workspaces popping up seemingly every day. And you're just like, what is this? Why am I a part of this? And in our case too, it's a very unique situation in higher ed that every course we teach gets its own workspace. So workspaces are created and then they're used and then they're sort of mothballed at a really rapid pace. So this is a, an example I made where showing that because of the different lengths of classes that I teach, you have some that are seven and a half weeks, some of that are full semester, 15 weeks, and then you have some that are permanent and they don't expire at the end of the school year. So next thing you know, you've created 10 to 12 independent classes just in one academic year. Um, so it's a little overwhelming. So all of these communication wins that I'm talking about are really to help create order as well as to elevate. Right, so that is really what I'm what, what I'm sort of talking about. That these communication wins are all series of elevations that you can use this stair step system to really level up. Quite literally, um, that's the metaphor that I want to install in your mind. So let's let's get right into it. Okay, these will be quick, but I think 
I want to open the door to your thinking here and uh, show you what we're working on. So the first one, custom emoji. Emoji are built right in. I don't know if you're using them already in Slack, but I'm sure you've seen them on your mobile phone or on uh, other you know, devices and systems. But yeah, you can use custom emoji in Slack to make the communication that much more interesting and more seamless. So this is an example of some pop culture um, emoji that we added. So obviously we got our Star Wars there. We got Star Trek as well. Uh, we also added uh, the Harry Potter houses and we, I like to survey my classes and ask them what house they associate with. And that's always a fun conversation starter. Um, people from all over the country showing their pride like Arizona and California state flags. Um, but we also use these for a very functional sort of um, conversation where we'll include symbols like the check and the cross so that you, you know immediately if something is approved or disapproved. Um, we have a flag system, which is like a, you know, a rag system, red, amber, green, where you have green means go, yellow means caution, and red means stop. And depending on what the conversation is, you can just throw a, a flag on it, almost like football, right? Flag on the play. Um, that really shortcuts a lot of communication and having to explain yourself. Uh, so, but we took that one step further and, and we start using these single and kind of two word phrases to just tag on to conversations. So we have these emoji and then whenever you want to, you know, let someone know that you're on it, that you've seen their request and you're taking action, just boom, tag it with the on it, come back later, tag it with done. So we have these short phrases. We use these a lot, especially as a shorthand amongst faculty and amongst teaching assistants where we really already have a, a relationship. You can just tag it. No prob. I don't really have to say to someone, thank you, Susan, for letting me know. I could just say no prob. And we already have that shorthand in place. So let me show you an example of how this is um, put into practice. So this is a conversation on the left with my teaching assistant. So she and I create a weekly to-do list. And you can see it's almost all emoji. It's barely verbal in the first place. And so we have uh, the actions, right? Approval for that assignment. And I, I tag her with it using the woman uh, emoji, mine or the man in that case. Give the flags, give the first 100. And we use 100 to indicate the score, of course. Uh, and she writes on it or she tags on it when she's seen that. And then coming back later, adding to the thread, she'll add done, right, to explain a little bit further. It's only saving you four characters of actual typing, but it's much more visual so you can see it at a glance, right? Moving over to the right side, this was a conversation in the Slack channel where a student is posting her file for a peer review. So not only do I come in or, or my teaching assistant come in and give it approval to say, hey, this, this document is okay. She gets approval for the assignment. Um, but then the peers come in and they leave reactions. So they give the heart and the thumbs up and they, they sort of participate in this conversation with a little bit more emotion. Uh, you can also see she actually puts her, I blacked out her name, but as you can see the status is a coffee cup. So that might have meant something like I'm on a coffee break or something like that. So emoji are totally fun in, uh, in the conversation. So like I mentioned, um, these are super fast, globally understood. They also lead to fewer actual messages because you can just drop an emoji and end the conversation right there um, without being rude, I think. So no explanation needed. When you tell someone plus one, it just means you're agreeing with their, with their opinion, right? Adds a shorthand and in the long run can definitely build that team culture. And as you saw, those are systematic. So you can expand them and add more. Um, some of the cautions, if you're going to use this, is that you need someone who can create these, right? It's hard to request these from an external source. It's much better if you build them yourself. Um, and then you will have to test and iterate the actual graphics for precision. Um, so there's that, that period, too, of adaptation where you start using them in the chat and people say, what the heck is this? What are you throwing out these symbols for? Trust me, it comes really quickly and it's really fun as it goes on. So let's move to the next one there. Um, we got the first win. That was the emoji. Now let's move on to what I call GCal for Teams feed. So that's abbreviated. It's a Google Calendar for Team Events app. <laughs> it's a mouthful. But this is an app that is actually built by Slack to integrate the calendars from Google Cal into your workspace. So on the left, you can see that I have a custom calendar for this particular course I'm teaching with all the due dates and assignments. And so each of these, uh, like I'm pointing to the, on the right side of the screen, there's an arrow pointing to that particular assignment. Um, essentially what happens is it will take these items from the calendar and it will print them into the channel. So you can see here in the center um, on the top is actually Sunday night. So it's telling you when things are due in four hours. And I, I set that parameter 
to give people a heads up that the presentation is due, it tells you the date, and then it says another one starting in four hours. So the language is a little unclear, I'll get to that in a second, but you can have these automatically arrive in the channel so everyone can see that there's a new assignment due in four hours, or in the case of Monday morning, it prints everything that's due that week. So anything that's in the calendar will automatically be pulled into the channel. And if you update the, the, the due date or cancel it outright, it will also give you an update automatically. So this integration is super helpful for keeping everyone on the same page, right? I think uh, we, next we just talk about the, the pluses, right? Visible for everyone, like I mentioned, it's in the main class channel. So everyone gets an alert, they, like, right? The at channel alert, um, no excuses. Everybody can see it. Uh, set it and forget it is, is another aspect of it. So this is the idea that it's automated, but it's also the sort of thing you have to set up once. And if you want to move a deadline, you just kind of drag it in your calendar and it will automatically update. So it's very light touch from our point of view. Um, and also, let's say you want to expand this. So you, if it's Google Calendar, you could integrate text messaging. You could integrate other notifications on your phone or on your computer. Um, you could sort of scrape that information down the road if you, if you know one of these tools like Zapier. Right? Some of the drawbacks, super quick. You do need to create a new calendar for each one. Uh, you can't have all your classes combined. That would just get overwhelming. And then you do have to experiment with the naming conventions, like I mentioned. So one of the things it'll say is like new event. You can't really customize it to say new assignment due, unfortunately. Um, and then also if there's nothing going on that week, but you have a weekly digest, it will say nothing happening this week which you kind of don't need to see, but maybe it could be nice if it's a, especially just a short class. Um, the tough thing is you gotta, I guess this is the same for any app. You have to wonder what really belongs in the channel. So that's a call that you can make in practice. But overall, this is your second win. So, oh, it keep, keeps going ahead, <laughs> double clicking. But yes, you got your second trophy. Let's go to the third one now. This is a little more complicated, but we're stepping it up. Workflow Builder for consistent team posts. Workflow Builder is part of Slack. It's a little more advanced, but it's available to everyone now. And so here's an, a use case that I wanna show you. So in, in the beginning, this is the before, um, two of my colleagues were posting internships. And you can see we're all posting it in a different way. So on the top, we have essentially a copy and paste that could come from an email, most likely, maybe it was on a website, okay. Gets, it gets the message across. Then the next one, a little bit of use of emoji, a little bit of use of formatting. And then I come in with maximum use of emoji and formatting. I'm really trying to make it a, a better reading experience. And so this is inconsistent and this is kind of annoying. Um, so I created a workflow. This is the middle during stage. I use the workflow builder. As you can see, there's a new internship opportunity. And then uh, as it expands on the right, you sort of tell it all the different steps, all the different fields of the form that you want to collect, and then how you want that to output when someone um, you know, clicks send or when it's completed. Um, so the result is that now we have a consistent internship experience. So this looks like um, two different posts, but they look identical. So we have the title of the post, we have that introductory paragraph, we have the bullet points, and then we actually made custom icons to use for these posts. So they really look consistent. And it, this helps the reading experience for everyone, especially on mobile. Because a lot of times what folks would do is they would just drag in a, especially for an, a, an event, not really for an internship, but if there's an event on campus, they would drag in the flyer of that whole event rather than type it up. And that's a really tough thing to handle on mobile if it's a PDF or something. So having a workflow that's really easy and approachable um, allows us to create that consistent experience. So some of the uh, advantages are that, like I said, consistent experience, that's the main thing. A workflow builder uh, looks pro, a workflow looks pro. And if you, especially if you learn to recognize it, everyone sees it and they say, oh yes, it's another one of these. I gotta be on the lookout for that. Um, it allows screening. So as a faculty member, um, I don't allow everyone to post the workflows, just other faculty. And if there's a problem, if they skipped essential information, if there's big typos, I can sort of kick it back to them and say, hey, um, make sure you fix this before you post it, uh, right? Time to post, that's a big one. Faculty members don't have a ton of time. So if they want to post something that they want the students to see with a high quality reading experience, it needs that form. It needs that sort of bulletproof methodology. And then of course, the, the workflows are expandable. So you can test them and you could change them. Um, we could talk in a second about 
new opportunities, right? But let me, let me bring some of the drawbacks or some of the cautions, I should say. So work, workflow builder is definitely young. It's only been out for a couple months and um, people are still asking for expansions and new requests. Like one of the first things is about these workflows that fork, right? Where you have like a yes and no decision, like a, um, a decision tree or a workflow uh, diagram, you know, that type of thing. And so there's also no computer logic if then, as you know, if this field is empty, skip to question five, that type of thing. Unfortunately, you can't do that yet. It's a very linear um, workflow. So it's almost like a form with some formatting with some stops and say, are you sure? That type of thing. But it's not, it doesn't have the real complexity that a custom app might have, for example. And then um, you almost automatically are going to need a testing channel. You're going to have to bang on it and make sure it works the way you want. So if you're going to dive into Workflow Builder as an administrator, as a professor, um, you're definitely going to have to spend a little bit of time with it, um, right? So, but aside, super quick off the top of my head, aside from posting internships, think about in a classroom what you could use for this consistent reading experience. So it could be events on campus. It could also be um, any peer-reviewed journals that you want to share with the, with the other faculty. They could just fill out this super quick form and then have, rather than saying every time, hey, everyone, I just made the paper, you know, super quick to fill it out. If there's a, um, an, a study that volunteers are needed, right? If there's the, the sort of thing that where it has to be anonymous, like you could have an anonymous um, survey of the whole class, 50 something people, 100 people, and they could fill out a form. So it takes their name off the, off the message. And you could say, hey, what was the, the toughest part of the week? Or what is most um, challenging or most exciting about this assignment? And you could have a whole channel just with those questions and answers anonymously using Workflow Builder. So that's a cool feature. You start thinking ahead about what you could do just by creating simple forms that print a prescribed format. Okay, so three wins. These are big. They're built in, emojis built in. Apps are a fingertip away. You know, they're sort of just below the surface. Go ahead and explore that. And then Workflow Builder is accessible to everyone. You got to play with it a little bit. But these are three communication wins that you can use to administer your Slack workspace. All right. And now I want to open the door to something even bigger. Okay. So these are just the beginning. We're just getting started. You have these even more massive wins, um, which I call, uh, well, one is, whoop, one is custom apps. And the next one essentially is new feature development. So things that could potentially be built into Slack down the road that can just enhance the experience. And uh, I want to toss to my colleague, uh, Dr. Mahasi, who is going to show you a bit about how these two can, uh, can be more approached. So Alex, go ahead, take it away. Thank you, Prescott. Um, I, I don't know if this is even more fancy of what I'm going to show. I think what you showed is, is very good to get the workspace more organized in, in an easy way. Um, and, and make participation and organizing the workspace much better already. So, but I want to tell you a little bit about what I'm doing and what I've been doing with my students um, and how I build a custom integration for Slack to, to help with teaching. So uh, a little bit of background just so Prescott already pushed a lot of information on you that is very, very important for this. Um, at ASU, we have one workspace per course, right? And I've been using Slack since I started at ASU, similar to Prescott. And I teach online and on campus. And I teach four to five courses per semester. I teach a lot of online. My courses usually have 60 to 120 students per course. So they're pretty big. And the courses are seven and a half to 15 weeks. So what we do need, I mean, we're using an LMS, right? We use Canvas. but I was never a fan of the Canvas discussion forum or the Piazza discussion forum. They're more formal, right? Students kind of seem to hesitate more to ask a question. So we opted to, to look for a better communication platform and we started using Slack at Software Engineering. So Slack is a lot more informal and needs or students feel more comfortable, it seems, to ask questions and like more informal question, even if they just hesitate, they also build more of a community, which is great for online students. They're separate, they're spread out all over the world or over the US. So they need a place to talk with the instructor and they need an easy way to reach us. So we've been using Slack as a discussion forum and as a group work tool so students can communicate with their groups when they have to do teamwork. 
So just a little bit about my workspaces. Um, my workspaces that are often seven and a half week courses with roughly 100 students have around 28,000 messages. And this leads to me, well, I need to be able to manage all of this, right? Um, yes, it's easier than getting this as emails. Slack is much easier to, to use in that sense, but I still need to be able to figure it out and see where are so open questions. Um, is there anything posted that I need to delete because someone posted a solution? So I need to be able to manage all of these Q and A's and I need to be able to create team channels for all these teams that work in teamwork. So I have a couple of challenges, right? I need to create a workspace for each course. These are four to five per semester. I need a good channel structure because students need to be able to figure out where to ask. I, for instance, have an announcement channel, a feedback channel, a final exam channel. I have channels for every topic we're covering. So students know where to ask, but I need to set these up. Students need to be able to contact the team. What happens a whole lot, and I don't know if that happens to Prescott, but we often have us as instructor and teaching assistants, and now the students need to figure out who do I ask? Who is online? So we came up, well, it would help if we have like a ticketing system where students can ask the whole teaching team and whoever is available can answer fast. We need to be able to make Q&As more visible so students see questions. So they see, hey, there is an open question or there is an answered question. So they don't pose the same question over and over again. And we need an easy way to create new channels. Okay, so we have all these things. So these lead to a bunch of challenges. Like the instructor needs to be able to set up the workspace. They need to be able to manage the public channels and private channels and the questions that are in there. We want to enhance engagement. We want students to not be afraid to ask. And we want students to know where to ask. So I guess I don't know where this line is coming from. Um, so we have all these challenges and our idea was we want to automate this. So we're going in the direction to automate even further than Prescott has talked about. So we wanted to build a custom integration using the Slack API and build a Slack app that is specific for our needs as instructor. And who is better suited than someone for one working in software engineering and for another, our students that learn software engineering and take our courses and know their requirements and what would help them. So what we did was last summer, this whole process started, I created a very simple prototype just to test what is possible. This prototype was then used in fall 19 in four of my courses to basically extract requirements from myself and from all the students I taught. And while I did that, a team of five students in a student project, they worked on researching how to develop Slack apps using the Slack API. And based on all these requirements we gathered here, they build a new prototype, a better prototype than I built here just to make a basically test case. And this app that the students developed was then used in five of my courses in spring to test, to extract even more requirements from myself and from my students. And still the team worked on things. And they, on the fly, they figured out if we have issues, new requirements, and actually made changes. And then starting summer, all of them graduated. They did a great job with the app and handed this over to me. And I used this bot then in my summer classes and I kept developing it because they were just not able to implement all the ideas we had and students came up with. So I wanna give a short video demonstration of what this bot can do. There's gonna be a lot of information and I'm just gonna show a small part of what this bot can do. And I hope to not overwhelm you. Um, if you have questions, I'm going to hang around on Slack afterwards, and I'm happy to explain more about it. So let's get into this. Yeah, so like, real quick, yeah. if you want to unshare and reshare, we think that annotation will disappear. Yeah, it's weird. If like, anyone else has. Okay. I'm sorry. On this. Let's see if that's better. I don't know where it came from. Is it better? I guess so. Okay. Uh, let's get into this, right? The first thing is we have the instructor workspace set up, right? As an instructor, I often teach the same courses, so I probably want to have the same channel structure. I'm sorry, wrong button. I need to start the video. Okay, so we want to set up the workspace. And that is always the same process of setting up 10 to 12 public channels. 
So this is a new workspace um, like we as instructor get when we get started with our course. And here you see the app and it has for the instructor two main things, set up for the course and managing student questions. And here you see a different option. We can manage a teaching team. I'm gonna go into this in a little bit. We can manage channels so we can create channels. I'm going to show this in a little bit, but even more interesting, I think, is creating profiles. What we came up with is we can create a profile with channels we like to have. So I created an example profile, which has five channels and we can import them at once. We don't have to manually create them. And this app will create all of these channels and the bot will mark them as these are default channels that every student should be added to. And now we have these channels that the bot added automatically. And now we might decide, hey, this wasn't great yet. We still need more channels. Yes, we can use a Slack feature and create each of these channels on its own. But that's a bunch of work if we want to create four or five. So we created a way to add multiple channels at once. So in here, I can type my channel names and I can say if I want to add everyone, or if I don't want to add everyone, then I can do this manually. Here I say I want to add everyone, I create them, and I create a bunch of more channels, right? Hopefully I name them a little better than I do in this example. But if I'd want to, I could now export this profile again. So next time when I import this profile, I have all of these channels already. This makes my setup much easier as an instructor. Next thing is, how can I add channel information so that students know where to post and what this channel is for? I don't know if you know that, but every channel in Slack has a topic and a description. You see that on the right hand side and this tells you what this channel is for. You can set this manually for each channel, but this also was a lot of overhead in my opinion. So I created a feature where you get a list of all your channels and you can just add your topic and your purpose in one dialogue. I'm not gonna show it for everything because it's gonna to take too long, but you see all channels are in there. And then I add this topic and the description for all of these channels. And I could export the profile again. And if I import it later on, all this information will be in my workspace already. So instead of spending 10 minutes or half an hour to set up my workspace, it takes me 30 seconds because I can import that profile if I've done it once. Now the teaching team, I talked about, it would be helpful if as an instructor or as a student, I could create a ticket to the teaching team. So I don't have to figure out who to ask, who is online, who can answer fast. Or I had this a lot of time that a student wrote every teaching assistant and myself, and now all of us answered. That's a lot of overhead. So in here, you see on the left-hand side is the instructor view. On the right-hand side is the same workspace from the student view. And we see now we have five people in here. We have me and a TA and three students. And now as an instructor, remember a left-hand side is the instructor, we can set up the teaching team. So I go in here and I can choose who is in the teaching team. So it's myself and the TA. And I can set the office hours for these people and can say this is when you can reach them. But honestly, my TAs are usually hanging around on Slack anyway. So and then I see I bought edit this and it created a private channel for my team. I can use this team channel to communicate with my team, but it's also our ticketing system. So what students can do now, I'm gonna refresh this app home, we'll see that down here, they now see the office hours from the teaching team and who is in my teaching team. This is very valuable to them. So how can they ask a question now privately about their assignment? Like, hey, could you check on my assignment? Am I going in the right direction? They don't want to ask privately, uh, publicly, I'm sorry. So they can basically go into any channel and use our Slack integration bot for that. So our bot is called Sparky for ASU and we can call Sparky Ask and it opens a dialog and we can say, hey, we wanna send this privately. And then they can type in their question here and submit this. This would lead to them getting a notification that, hey, this worked. And they will also get basically a copy of their question down here in that Sparky app. And they'll have a resolve button. So they can say, hey, I asked this. Oh, I figured it out and can click resolve. On the instructor view here on the left-hand side, we see we have a ticket in that private channel that student C had a question. We see the question and we now have the ticket that we can answer this. 
and whoever is available first can answer this. So how do we answer this as an instructor or a TA or GSA, UGTA, anyone who's in that teaching team? We can say answer directly, which will open a dialogue, and we can answer the question right in there. What the Slack integration will do, it will send a direct message to our student. For one, we get this new view on the instructor side that tells us someone got in contact with a student. And on the student side, we see that the student got a message now with the question and the answer. And they can now say, oh, this is resolved. Or they can communicate with this person. But now it was marked as resolved. And now look at the view on the team channel. We see that we have a green bar here now that tells us, hey, this is answered. So our ticket is basically done. So we have an easy way to see if something has been answered or not. Similar, the whole thing works for public questions, which are a little bit easier because they can just use the public channels. But they also have the option to make things a little bit more visible, is to also use the Sparky Ask and ask publicly so they're not using the send privately option and just submit their question. And now we also see we have this red bar there that tells us, hey, this is an unanswered question. And as an instructor, of course, I see this question. I can go in. I basically started saying questions need to be answered in threads to keep things organized. Now this question has been answered. And the student might see that answer and say, yes, this answered my question and marks that whole question as answered. Now we see we have this green bar there and we have that trophy. So we're going back to custom emojis saying, hey, yes, this has been answered. The instructor can endorse the answer and say, yes, I approve this answer. This is what you can go by. So this makes a whole Q&A more visible for the student and for the instructor. So I want to show this a little more with a couple of more question and answers just really quick. So we see in here, same channel, week one UML, and we just see a couple of questions answered and unanswered. Everything that is answered has that green bar, everything that is not answered yet, where the student has not say, yes, this is answered, we see that red bar. And we see if an instructor has approved that answer all right. So, and we have a similar thing in our Sparky team channel where we see everything with a red bar says, hey, this is not answer yet. Maybe someone claimed the question already got in contact with a student, but it's still not resolved. Or in the next question, we see no one got in contact with a student yet at all. No one has claimed it. Um, and the next two, they were answered. One of them was resolved in a direct message and the other one was resolved by the student themselves. Maybe they answered or they asked and figured it out themselves. Like, oh, this is the answer. So they mark it as resolved. And on our side as an instructor, we see, oh, the student figured it out. We don't have to worry about it anymore. So this is a short overview of what this bot can do. So as a summary, it helps you create new channels. It helps you create profiles and import these profiles. You can set up a teaching team, which helps students see, hey, this is a teaching team. This is where they have office hour and they can ask private questions. But I didn't show we have a simple Canvas integration, which is still in development, where we can import assignment due dates and um, private teams into Slack and display them there and create private channels for that. Um, that works, but it's very prototype-like. Um, we have a good way of marking question and answer. Students can ask privately and publicly, and we have a pretty good way of showing if things are resolved or not. I wanna say a special thanks to the team that worked for a year on the bot to create the initial version of it. I think they did a great job on that. Um, just a couple of things for the future. We want to get better at a start getting started tutorial and activity reminder. So we see if a student is not active. We want to use a Slack search a little better to find Q and A's. And we want to have kind of an award system for good questions, good participation, which is not in there yet. If you're interested to know more or if you're interested to use a bot, feel free to contact me on this email address. I can tell you a little more about the bot and tell you how to install it. It is a prototype. It's kind of my little private project, which I'm happy to share if you guys are interested, um, but it is still a prototype and not a fully developed software. So this is it from my side. If you have questions, feel free. I don't know if we still have time 
to ask now or I'll hang around on Slack for a while and I'm happy to talk about things a little more. And I would hand back to Ellie then. Thank you so much, Dr. Alexandra. Wow, thank you both Prescott and Alex. I think um, that window into how you're conducting your courses today is pretty reflective of this morning's theme where, you know, it's not just this big futuristic problem to solve. The important part today is kind of that crawl, walk, run mentality of what can you do and what can you try and what can you iterate on. Um, so I find it fascinating that we got to see the spectrum here today of obviously one, find the place where you are going to round up the audience that would partake in the classroom but then have fun with things like emojis that you can encode some shorthand and community into your dialogue um, and have students participate in that process, right? Uh, all the way up through, you know, leveraging the, the apps that might be available and exploring what's out of the box uh, available to you via Slack. And then if you are graced enough to have Alex's skills as a developer uh, or surround yourself with teammates like her students who, who have that ability, uh, that's really why our Slack APIs exist, so that you can build where you don't have a solution at hand. Um, and I think the, the two things that stand out the most from what you shared is all of those solutions involved some sort of student input or direct action from students. Because I think, as we talked about earlier as well, we're, we're trying to meet students where they are. They have a key role to play in the solutioning process too and kind of upholding innovation that's important to them. I know we do have uh, just under 10 minutes left and we had a couple insightful questions come in through the channel that I want to make sure we let our professors address. Starting with um, maybe one from earlier on in the session when we were talking to, to Prescott's workflow builder and the calendar sync, but in general, how are you both viewing how Slack sits alongside Canvas not necessarily a direct integration, but how you manage both. Sure, I'll take that. Um, I, I wrote that in the chat. Um, a couple of people kind of had the same question at the same time. Um, unfortunately, the Google Calendar integration that I showed is essentially a workaround for not having a proper Canvas app. Um, if, if there was a native way to pull in the Canvas deadlines, uh, then we wouldn't need that that Google Cal integration, at least not for that. I mean, it could use it for other things. If there's pizza parties sporadically throughout the semester, let's put those in the calendar. Um, but no, unfortunately it's not as tightly integrated as we would like. Um, essentially I tell my, every professor does it differently, but I tell my students very clearly that Slack is the way we communicate. We don't use the discussion boards. We don't use the announcements. We don't use email. Um, we, we just use Slack. And if they email me, I, I basically give them one strike. You know, if they email me in week 14, I, I don't even respond um, because I trained them how to use Slack. And actually in the whole class, we have an assignment zero that essentially says, send me a direct message to teach them how to create a user account if they don't have one. And then to, to DM me, which is an important skill. And then they have to introduce themselves, which is just, you know, posting um, broadly to the class. So... <clears throat> So I, I tell them pretty plainly, the content and the assignments are in Canvas, but the communication and the crosstalk is all in Slack. Um, they are a little bit of, you know, separate islands that you have to row across the bridge or row between, whatever you want to call that. Um, so not quite as integrated, but I believe, Alex, that you're working on some integrations, as you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I do a similar thing. All content is on Canvas. Um, but all communication is on Slack. So basically, please don't send emails. If you have questions, send them on Slack. And yes, Canvas integration is, is a big part. And one thing I hear a lot from students, like I have to switch back and forth. Why can't I ask Slack for the assignment due dates? So um, what I did is a very basic integration right now into my app so I can pull Canvas due dates and Canvas Teams, I mean, ideal it would be to say, send reminders and automatically have that integration in there. Um, but I think that's still a, a little bit farther away. So we're kind of working with what we have right now. 
Great, thank you. Um, and we've got another question that I, I suggest we actually take into the Slack workspace for shaping ADU under um, the down by the docs section around, you know, other ideas and brainstorming about how to use workflow builder in the classroom. It sounds like another Alexander on the call has been experimenting with it as well, but I think that could be a really robust dialogue to have together within Slack. Um, but I do want to, to double check with Alexander and Prescott on, you know, from our experience together collectively, it's been a little over a year where we've seen this experiment play out uh, in, the for, in the course perspective specifically. So have you received any direct feedback from students or maybe some curious peers on how this has felt to be a part of? I think I've heard a lot from students <laughs> because I did, at the beginning I did use, I think once I used the Blackboard um, discussion forum and I used Piazza and then I switched over to Slack. And I think communication has greatly increased using Slack. Um, community has greatly increased using Slack. Students feel, especially online, feel like they're in a classroom because they can communicate there. And I think that is the pro I hear a lot from students. The con I hear a lot of from students is that Canva, uh, no, sorry, Slack can get a little overwhelming sometimes when they open up Slack, especially in online after 24 hours and they see they have 100 new messages they decide to not read it and just post their question again because they don't want to scroll through the whole thing. So that is where we came up with this question and answer thing to kind of mark questions and answers in a good way. So general chatter and all this doesn't even show up as visibly. And that my feedback from last year when we used the bot is that they do like this informal formal way of asking a question because I don't think the question just goes out into the void but they see that it's marked and they're like oh okay someone looked at it right and um, there is feedback that they say they like that because otherwise it feels sometimes too informal um, but this kind of I hope gives like kind of a middle ground between formal discussion forum and nice and kind of light slack conversation but hey this is a question that's important i i've actually had on slack in general i've had hot and cold reviews so some people will say and it's funny reading them because they're literally right next to each other in the list they'll say oh my god slack is amazing this is so fun like it's so easy to do the peer reviews and to share and yada yada and then other people will say why do i have to learn something new why can't we just use the discussions why can't we use this and that and it's so funny to kind of read that. Um, you know, ultimately, what it boils down to is, why do I have to do something that I don't, I don't want to do? And it's like, well, because that's the way of the world, first of all. But also, this is better. So, I absolutely ad acknowledge that it is a little bit of fragmentation, right? There's no single tool that does everything. Because if you think about it, Canvas or Blackboard or whatever you're using, uh, that doesn't have, you know, a word processor in it. That doesn't have a presentation file or a photo editor. So like you're going to have to use multiple tools. The question is, do you know which one does what? And can you switch, you know, switch modes or switch uh, thinking methods? Um, that's the, that's the question, but. I definitely appreciate both of your willingnesses to, to inspire that uh, willingness to experiment and try new things and include your student voice in that process. Um, again, thank you for joining us today and for anyone who's scrambling to try and copy the, the links or the questions from the Zoom chat, we will post uh, a recap of those again in the Down by the Docs channel where we can kick off the workflow builder brainstorming.